Israel is a small country in the Middle East with 8 million people and 9 million startups. And we wanted to find out why that was. So we thought we'd bring together a group of interesting Israelis who could answer that question. Okay, Israel is a great country. Israel is a big country with very few startups, only one startup by an individual. <laughs> is it okay? Everybody has their own. Every, yeah, everyone has his exactly, own startup. When, you, when you're born, you get a little thing where a little you business, start business with permit. Like this, exactly. Okay. It's a country of entrepreneurs, of innovators, a country with uh, great, great uh, education and a great spirit of entrepreneurship. And then we decided the best person to put that together is a guy named Yossi Vardy, whose name will be well known to anybody who goes to conferences. And so Yossi assembled this all-star team. And then he was in Shanghai last night trying to get here from the Mobile World Congress. And an unfortunate lady closed the airplane door in his face. And so he got Shanghai. This is what he said. In English. This is what he said. Yes, that's what he said. This is what he said. It was Shanghai, as we say in English. Exactly. So, unfortunately, but manfully, David Rowan, the editor of Wired UK, is going to impersonate David. you. So bring everybody up. David is impersonating Yossi. Okay. Uh, you get this so thing. David, it's very unfortunate to have you, because replacing Yossi is an impossible task. I don't have his Jewish mother joke. That's true. I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay. I think you get the passing of the mic. Okay. Okay. All set. Good. Merci. Bonjour, Boketov. This is a little Israeli island in the middle of Paris. I'm David Rowan. I edit Wired magazine in the UK, and I travel to Israel probably four times a year because there's an awful lot of innovation happening there and an awful lot of companies growing very fast internationally. And we are lucky that on the stage now, we have some experts, a couple of very successful investors, a couple of those fast growth startups, a man who is bridging the corporates and the startups, and the man from the ministry who is helping ensure everything grows smoothly. And our mission in the next 40 minutes is to get some sense of where the opportunities are, what is working in Israel that could be translated into other markets, um, particularly in Western Europe. And I, I guess how you help big corporations start to feel that startup vibe. And one of the people sitting next to me, just like a lot of Israelis, as well as running a fund which has 220 companies managing $2 billion. Largest VC, I think, in Israel. Um, like many people in Israel, he had a military career before that, pilot in the Air Force for 10 years, um, and then helped build companies like Anubit that was bought by Apple, 90 IPOs and M&As is Chemi Perez, who is co-founder of Pitango VC. Chemi, what are you looking for when you're putting Pitango money into an Israeli company? Thank you very much for the question. Um, we have a great example on stage. Adam Singolda runs Tabula. She's one of the companies that we invested in. And when we invest in a company, we look for a few things. Number one, we look for great entrepreneurs with a great vision, just like Adam. Persistency, a great technology, carving themselves a category that they are actually leading. And personally, when I invest in, in a company, I would like to see an ability to grow the company to revenues beyond a billion dollars and become a global player. So with that in mind, with the underlying technology, a global view, great entrepreneurs and great business model, this is exactly what we like to support. And Adam is a, a wonderful example of cutting edge technology, building the next generation companies in Israel. Tell us a bit more about no, no, no Tabula, pressure. Adam. Tell us what Tabula does and how fast you've been growing. 
So do you know when you read the news on many, many websites, at the bottom of the article it says, you may also like recommending you more articles you may like similar to when you buy a product on Amazon? We do that. Um, so we started the company eight and a half years ago. Uh, Chemi was crazy enough to invest in me and giving us a chance. Uh, the first five years were kind of rough. Uh, in 2012, we started to grow from hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue to a little over half a billion dollars this year. So uh, we're halfway of, of making Chemi happy, uh, but we're on track. So we're excited about a future that will be completely personalized when people can be connected with things they may like and never knew existed. So you've raised about $160 million from Pitango and Advanced Publications and a whole bunch of others, the Daily Mail. Um, you've got offices out of Israel. You're serving customers around the world. But essentially, you're a Tel Aviv company. So what are the downsides as well as the upsides of being based in a little country in the Middle East? I mean, I think, you know, I believe in competitive advantage. So I think Israelis are extremely good at um, cracking the first problem and being obsessed about something like a commando, you know, like an army unit, but outside of the army. So we're very good at being focused and doing one thing and really go at it. And I think it becomes more challenging as you start to scale. So with us, I don't think we're better than other companies in building processes as an Israeli company. It's hard for us too. So we try to focus on, instead of scaling processes, scaling the culture of a small company. So, you know, like invest in transparency, invest in, um, you know, people feel like it's still a small startup, no political, no hierarchy. We have this TV in the kitchen. You've been to our offices. So when you make coffee, there's a TV. You can see people making coffee in other offices. So you can feel like it's one big office. Um, so things of that nature. Every week we have a weekly toast when we talk about mistakes. Uh, we call it the economy of good enough. Uh, so people are feel comfortable talking about how they messed up uh, so we can keep doing it and move faster. So our focus is on um, scaling the culture versus scaling processes, which I think is not great for us. And Femi, you're also, as well as in Europe, you're in China. Why do you see China as the opportunity? Yeah, so the first uh, thing that we observed is basically that there is an English-speaking internet market. And there is a Chinese internet market, and I'm not sure which one is bigger. But if you have Google on one side, you have uh, Baidu on the other side. And since Israel has no local market, and unfortunately we're just trying to build a regional market, um, our markets are global. So it doesn't matter if an entrepreneur goes on plane, takes a flight to uh, the west or the east, as long as they can do global business. So when Tabula raised money in the last, in the last round, uh, investors were among uh, European investors like LVMH. Uh, we also had investors like, uh, like uh, Baidu from China, like Yahoo Japan uh, from Japan. And actually, uh, 10 years ago, Pitango would raise money from global investors. I would say 80% comes from the US, 20% comes from Europe and Israel. Today, I would say that the distribution is almost equally distributed between US investors and Asia Pacific investors. And then the rest is European and Israeli. So for example, uh, we have in investors like uh, Samsung from uh, Korea. We have investors from uh, China, from Singapore, from Japan, from India. And uh, we try to help our companies also bridge uh, to those markets through their investments. So a man who sees a very big opportunity in China, who's in fact created a $200 million fund working between China and Israel, um, is Edouard Kukieman, who's founder, managing partner of Catalyst Investments. Now, Catalyst, just to clarify, is both investment banking, raising more than $5 billion for Israeli companies, but you're also with private equity building investments. Now, what do you see as the advantage of working with Chinese investors? I think your last fund was entirely Chinese money. Well, first, uh, the investment banking is Kukerman & Co., which is uh, raising money all over the, the globe, but mostly for 20 years we've raised uh, money from Europe, and only recently we opened an office in Shanghai, and now we have 12 people in Shanghai raising money in Shanghai. 
Regarding the uh, Israeli-China uh, fund that we established recently, uh, it's, I would say, about 55% Chinese investors, uh, and the rest is mostly European, Israelis, and Americans. But what is very particular with the fund is really, we have a local partner in China that is uh, with 12 people based in Hong Kong and Beijing, and the role of the Chinese partner is to help our portfolio companies entering into the Chinese market, which is very difficult for many Israeli firms, you know, with a cultural gap that there is, with a language uh, uh, barrier. We have a local team that is able to provide the support that is necessary to help the Israeli company grow in China. So, Edouard, you moved to Israel from France in 1989 and then studied at the Technicon. You've co-written a book, Israel Valley, Le Bouclier Technologique de l'Innovation. What did you see that Israel has that made you think of it as a kind of new kind of Silicon Valley? I see here the co-writer of the book, Daniel Roach, and actually we, we try to explain the Israeli business model and uh, what is really particular, you mentioned that Chemi is really uh, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit that there is in Israel, but also the role of the army, the support of the government that is very active. We explain also the link, the very strong link there is between the universities and the industry, the high-tech industry in Israel, with all those licensing companies that are selling the technology developed at the universities into the industrial uh, market. But what I think is very particular is the fact that uh, Israeli companies, the same way that they would export their product globally, they will also raise money globally. Chemi mentioned that uh, today uh, any technology company can access a global uh, uh, funding, but you see that also in the number of Israeli companies that went public overseas. There have been 220 Israeli companies that went public on the NASDAQ, and people may be less familiar with the fact that there have been more than 100 Israeli companies that went public in Europe. Actually, my first venture fund of 1993, I took it public in Paris in 97, and, and eventually we had 5,000 French shareholders that invested in Israeli companies. So we, we see that trend, and uh, I will not be surprised that in the coming years we'll see Israeli companies also going public in Asia, whether it's in Hong Kong or in Singapore. So it's not just the private investors that are helping build these companies. The government is also playing a role. And Amit Lang, um, who's Director General of the Economy and Industry Ministry, you are putting in some early stage grants to some of these companies. Give us an example of how this works and any beneficiaries of your grants that have gone on to big things. Well, uh, we, don't give, we don't grant only in early stages. We uh, tend to give grants and to support in every stage of the company. Uh, and actually, it's some kind of conditional grant. We believe that if the company is, success, if the company is successful later on, and uh, there's a lot of revenues, and she drives, drives the revenues, then she can pay back. If it's not, then we, uh, we uh, let, the, let the grant uh, go. Uh, this is the way uh, we support. And what uh, are you giving the grants for that the private sector is not financing? Well, uh, we give the grants for uh, the R&D, uh, the research and development, and uh, we, looked at it, we look at it and examine it uh, through all the same kind of the same criteria which Chemi mentioned earlier. If it's innovative enough, if, if there is a potential for a market uh, share later on, and, and if it's a, if it's a breaking, uh, a, a very smart technology is a breakthrough technology. This is how ex we examine it. Give us an example of a company that you can name that's benefited from... Well, we usually don't give the names of the company due to their... They ask us not to give it, but according to foreign sources, uh, Waze, who was bought by Google uh, uh, a few years ago, were uh, supported by the, by the government. Uh, and most of the companies who does very good later on, whether it's a, if it's an exit, whether it's if they are growing uh, to be a big, a big company, usually use uh, somewhere in their stages uh, the support of the government. So this is Waze, the crowdsource mapping company that became a billion dollar exit. Um, right. Why would they need 
help from the ministry? How did they use that money from you? Well, I guess the government of Israel um, in the last decades um, managed to find the right formula uh, of the mixture between the private sector and the government sector. I mean, the gov in the end of the day, if you look at, uh, at the macro data, you see that Israel uh, spent maybe uh, first in the world in expenditure uh, from the JDP on R&D. And it has a lot to do with, uh, with the budget that the, ma that the government puts uh, first and leverage the private sector's money in the end of the day. And I guess uh, we, find that we, we, find, we managed to find the right formula between uh, the right amount of money that the government is putting to the market in order to leverage to the maximum uh, with the private sector. If I, if I may add uh, the investor view, basically, when we invest in companies, we'd like them to take that money and use it for sales and marketing. Investing in innovation is an expense in a way, even though it should be considered as an investment. What the government is doing, they are saying, we're giving you money specifically to innovate. That means that all the other funding can be supporting the growth. That's the partnership that we have. Now, because it's secret who you fund. You can't tell me if you've been helping fund Remunis, who's an entrepreneur sitting at the end of the panel. Well, but ask her. She's going to tell us if you're funding. Um, so Reem is based in Nazareth. It's an Arab-Israeli business um, called Alpha Omega that makes tools to help drill into the brain. Could tell us about what Alpha Omega is doing and tell us why your company is not typical of the Israeli startups that we usually see on stages? Uh, well, as you said, I'm from the Arab community, and actually we started the company out of a very sad uh, starting. When Imad, my husband, graduated from the Technion, he could not find a job because most, during the 80s, most of the high-tech industry was dominated by the military and Arabs could not join this kind of high-tech. So basically the dream was to start a high-tech company and employ Arab engineers that they will not go through the Via de la Rosa that we did go through. The company now is about 23 years old. We, do, we are in the neuro, neurosurgery business. We help uh, people with neural disorders uh, like Parkinson disease, neurosurgeons can operate today on these people by implanting an electrode inside the brain and connecting it to a battery to a stimulator. So what the systems of Alpha Omega do is that basically they find, they locate the target by, let's say, like the same like Google map, but we do Google inside the human brain. So about the innovation, I would say that from day one, we got money from the chief scientist. And this was very crucial to us because like our company is still private owned. We we're still like we started from bootstrapping. So basically the money that we got from the government doubled the capacity for innovation. When you get 50% and you invest the other 50%, so here you, got, you can double your innovation. And this was crucial for Alpha Omega, especially Alpha Omega. I'm not talking about companies which Chemi said about that they got investments, but for companies who choose not to be like uh, to be private owned, this is crucial. And it's not just a little startup. You now have 75 people in Alpha Omega, and you're selling all over the world, but you're still based in Nazareth with a workforce that is a mix of Christian Arab, Muslim Arab. Jews, Americans, Germans, like we do believe that diversity, from diversity you can get innovation. And the statement of, uh, of the company is very strong. Like we believe that if everybody can work toward one mission, so everybody will be involved. And this is a very successful model in Alpha Omega. So basically, all of the people that you said, like we, we work with, like we have a very diverse workforce and with another two uh, companies, one in the US, another one in Germany. 
Yet we don't hear of very many Arab Israeli tech businesses that go and scale internationally. What are the conditions that we need? What are the changes that we need to have more alpha omegas? I'll tell you what, what I think we had. I think we were naive. We were very stubborn to succeed. And uh, our belief is that if you try 100 times, so the 100 at one will succeed. But I mean, like, talking now, what can change the periphery and the Arab community? I would say that the investments that the government is supplying are crucial. And uh, I would see, like, we, we need the cooperation of, of three, of, of three uh, uh, bodies, the government, the NGOs, and the private business sector. Like companies like Alpha Omega need to think that we need to, to get entrepreneurs out of our company to encourage entrepreneurship out of the company. And this is actually what, we, we're, what we're doing. Like already five employees who went out of Alpha Omega started their own entrepreneur, entrepreneurships. Zach Weisfeld is bridging the startup world and the corporate world. You are general manager and founder of Microsoft's Global Accelerators. You are working with early stage companies, many of which have had exits already, Kitlocate being bought by Yandex, Apixia by Wix, and you run kind of customized programs to help develop these businesses. I think you've raised, through the companies, they've raised about $2 billion so far with about 30 something exits. Um, why do we need a corporate accelerator when there are so many smart investors a bit of government money, entrepreneurs who are going to build a company, whatever. Why do we need you in the middle? It's, it's a great question. And many of the friends here, when we started, said, Zach, not a single entrepreneur in his right mind would want to come to a corporate accelerator. Why should, you, should they? And what can you bring to the table? So I think corporates are facing a very big challenge these days. Um, disruption is everywhere. You know, Almost every major corporate is facing an Uber moment. Right, and which, it's, which takes a toll on their profits, take a toll on their headcount. It, it's, a, it's a big thing that's happening out there. And um, we believe that a lot of the innovation, even for big corporates, are going to come from startups and also from skunk work internally, which is almost like, like uh, um, startups. So we've started the program about uh, four years ago, actually April 22nd, 2012, in Israel. We started the first... Uh, Microsoft Accelerator to help bridge that gap, bring super strong startups and connect them with corporates and, and do this uh, cycle of innovation because we felt that we as Microsoft need to be connected to these kind of startups. And as you said, we have almost 500 graduates from all over the world. They raise about $2 billion. 80, 81% of them got funded. 32 exits through acquisitions, three through IPOs. So it's working. It's working well for the entrepreneurs. And it's working very, very well for us. So um, it's, we believe it's a new kind of engagement that helps both the ecosystems and the startups. Israel's a bit of a hub for R&D labs, for yeah. innovators. I think I've, we, we counted about 300 R&D units. And working with companies from all over the world. Um, what is it that makes it so attractive to build your R&D hub in Israel? So the, the usual case, like with us, with IBM, with Intel, Israel was the first place uh, we've gone outside of the US, mostly because of the talent. So the technology, technological talent in Israel is very unique, uh, very strong. And a lot of, the cor a lot of these corporates want to go after that, um, that kind of talent. Um, I think now we actually offer much more than just engineering talent. Israel is expensive, right? Israel is not a place where you go to uh, uh, outsource your engineering. It's a place where you go to have sometimes small teams that are doing things that are, are completely outside of what the norm or the things that the corporate would do. I can actually tell you even the, the, the program that I run, I believe if we, we have started it in Redmond, where our headquarters, it probably wouldn't have gone as far as it, it's gone 
um, um, with, with us running it out of Israel, the global program. Because, you know, we tend to do it the way we believe is the right way, sometimes not easy to our corporate counterparts, uh, but with a lot of passion, um, a lot of dedication. You know, people will work through, you know, nights and days and weekends because they strongly believe in the cause. Um, and, and the ability to bridge differences, difficulties, think completely outside of the box, do things that sometimes for us corporates are tough to, to accept, that may not go exactly according to all of the procedures that, are, uh, that you are supposed to follow, but at the end of the day brings a lot of great innovation. So, this is, so you're right, there are about 300 global R&D centers. Um, I hope we can support so many developers in Israel, and I think part of it is, is getting to, to additional kind of talent from the Arab world, from the ultra-Orthodox world, from other, other um, um, groups that we haven't touched in the past. Amit, what is it about the Israeli talent pool that has allowed the world to build their R&D center there? Why are they not building their R&D center in Paris or Berlin or London? Well, as Tzach said, it's connected with the talent, but I think it goes back to the early days of the establishment of the country 67 years ago. A uh, small country, very hostile, not very nice neighborhood. Uh, survival mode, uh, which can be only um, be uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment which uh, you have to invent yourself every time, again and again. Scarcity, very scarcity in, uh, in natural resources, not much water, desert area. So uh, very, very uh, big threats uh, from your neighbors, so you have to uh, invent yourself uh, through technology uh, regarding the defense issue. Uh, and, and when you look at the history, you see that this mentality was built over this survival mode and over this need to invent yourself from scratch every time again and again to overcome all kinds of obstacles and uh, of the creation of, the, of, a, of a living country and a, and a developed country. Uh, and uh, the former uh, head of the, of the, the governments uh, during uh, those years uh, invested a lot in uh, science, in uh, research and development, and that was spilled over to the industry uh, later on and uh, brought us to where we are. And that this mentality was built during this year uh, in order to create the great talent and the great uh, entrepreneurial spirit that we find uh, today in Israel. And not in anywhere else, I think, in the world. So, Kemi, you are part of a family that's done its bit to promote the Israeli entrepreneurial scene. Your and father was president of Israel, Shimon Peres, who, for instance, decided that there was going to be a focus on brain research and other research projects. But now that You've seen both sides. You've seen from the government side through the family experience and through the VC side. How much impact do you think politicians can actually have when a tech ecosystem is really about the entrepreneurs themselves deciding to do something? Well, I think governments can play a major role. Uh, first of all, by putting the mindset of transitioning from uh, an old era where you really cared about uh, natural resources and land into a world of innovation and technology, uh, which really put a big question mark on what happened with uh, the UK moving b back to their borders instead of opening up to the global market. But uh, basically, we're moving into a new era where governments uh, can no longer deal with the processes that are globalized, whether it's the economy nor with the uh, terrorism. So they need to be supportive in moving their societies into an open market, a global market, a digital economy, and build their strength based on the foundation of deep research and education, and let the entrepreneurs and the innovation societies build great companies for the global market. I'll give an example, you know, when France invented the Minitel, the Minitel was locked within the borders of France. Could have been the capital of uh, the internet. Would have never happened in Israel. 
because the way we think is really about global markets. So I think today, uh, governments need to play a role where they encourage their talent to go abroad. For example, the Australian government is now making a major effort to become into an innovation nation. And I would like maybe to summarize by saying that Churchill, in 1942, when he spoke in the US in front of students in one of the Ivy League universities, he actually said that the empires of tomorrow are the empires of the mind. I'm very much uh, subscribed to the concept, and I think that the Israeli government in many generations has been very supportive of that by encouraging uh, education, by investing in research and development. I think the next step is to create more inclusivity, and Israel just recently signed an agreement to, with uh, Cisco to become a digital nation. Uh, governments can really set up challenges, like uh, uh, an American president to set up a challenge to put a man on the moon, or like uh, President Obama suggesting that we get rid of cancer. Um, I think we need great global leaders that have in mind the understanding of where the new era is heading. David, there's another thing that governments have to do, and we're here in, in France, which, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs here, we have a program here. There are labor laws, there are taxation issues. Governments have to help solve these because some of these are actually preventing um, startups being successful. When you can't hire or fire and when you have issues with uh, again, taxation, that people don't want to exit in the country that they live in, then you don't have uh, success stories to, to build on. You don't have mentors in your ecosystem to work with. So, there, there are a lot of, I agree with everything that was said so far, but there is um, an, Im an important part of government to solve some of these um, points that makes it hard to start a company in these, company, in, in these countries. So let's help out Emmanuel Macron, the economy minister who's been around the conference, who is pledged to making France more digitally competitive. So we can't give him all the conditions that Israel's benefited from, apart from some people in the UK, he's not surrounded by hostile enemies. Um, <laughs> they, the French don't have the same military investment that Israel has, but talk about this empire of the mind. What do you see in specific recommendations that he should go and implement that has worked inside Israel? Uh, I think what is very particular regarding the government support in Israel is that the, the, the government uh, is not involved in uh, being on the board or being active in the portfolio company level. If you look at France, for example, there are organizations like Caisse des Depots or BPI, which are really becoming shareholders of those companies. If you look at many of the initiatives made by uh, the Israeli government, like the incubator program, they are financing private groups that are launching, uh, on average, I think 400 projects, financing 400 projects per year. But once a company is successful, they are reimbursing the money that they have got from the incubator program. But they are, the government is not a shareholder, so it's not involved in the decision-making process within the companies. And even if you look at the historical support that the government gave to venture capital community, with a program like Yozma. The Yozma program enabled for us to get access to money with co-investors, uh, the government co-investing alongside the venture capital community, but they were always letting the private venture capital community selecting the companies. They were not really involved in the selection process, and therefore they didn't interfere with the way the entrepreneurs could develop their business activity. And I think that's very unique and particular to Israel. So the right mix of private and public, what else should he be doing? What would have created the French Adam Singolder, the French Tabula, that you had advantages by being based in Tel Aviv? And just just on, on the previous note, I mean, one thing that I can tell you is we're talking about becoming a global company. You can't really have offices in every country in Europe. You can't really have offices in every country in Asia Pacific or Latin America. 
right? So more often than not, companies like us from Israel will have centralized hubs when they'll have talented people that are, have a mindset of being entrepreneurs. And from there, they'll travel to the place they need to go, make the sale, you know, create business and come back. And you have to, you know, you're in a position when you have to make a decision, where is that centralized hub? Um, so for us in Asia Pacific, it's Bangkok. For us in Europe, it's the UK. Um, so we have Israel, UK, Bangkok. In America, it's New York, right? And it's been very efficient for us to hire people and to, to be able to operate those business units in, the, in those countries or in those places and from there to, uh, you know, to grow the business. I do think in France, it's a bit more challenging uh, when you think about can France be the hub for Europe? Um, and I think, if, you know, I think that's something that's worth con considering, especially given the recent news with the UK, um, because when it comes to tax and labor, you can really help companies, small companies like us, to consider you becoming the centralized hub for the next three, four, five years, which will b bring you know, great economi uh, economical benefits to the country. Did you consider for a moment relocating your team from the UK when you heard the news last Friday? Well, it's, uh, the first thing I heard was, don't worry, nothing is going to happen for the next few years. Um, but we did, like many other people, searched uh, for alternatives and who we can speak with about what that means. But no, I mean, we're very confident in our base in the UK. I don't think things will change in the next few years. And we were stand, you know, committed behind the employees. That we have 50 employees there. So we stand you know, very committed behind it. But I do think it's a shame. Uh, because we have people in, in the UK from all over Europe. And that's going to make it much more complicated. Yeah, don't blame me. I'm just Yossi Vardy in this panel, OK? So tax and labor to be competitive. Amit, if you weren't running the Jerusalem ministry, but you were in Paris, what would you be doing that they're not yet doing? Actually, first I want to say it will be very difficult to imitate the Israeli ecosystem. It's a really uh, difficult things to do, thing to do in my side. But I would say it's a sum of a mixture of all. You, you've mentioned taxation. Sure, you have to have a very attractive taxation regime uh, regarding the ecosystem. You have to, be a very, you have, to have a very flexible uh, labor market. And you have to overcome the obstacle of uh, funding and a lot of the governments are falling in that uh, manner, funding the ecosystem in R&D without interfering and taking to be a shareholder and to try and think that you know better from the private sector. Give them the money, lower the risk, share the risk, and it will happen in the end of the day. This is our experience. So we've got about five minutes, and I now want to go on to something that maybe we don't yet know very much about which is the future opportunities of growth inside Israel. And we have some people on this panel who know an awful lot about where the trend lines are going. And just based on what sort of companies you're seeing and what research is coming out of the universities and the R&D clusters, um, I'm just going to ask you to share some very specific thoughts on what companies are going to be making waves maybe in two years, three years, five years, and what kind of sectors? So for instance, Hemi, you are very prominent in investing, among other things, in life sciences. Are there any particular trend lines that we should be aware of? Yeah, so uh, the first uh, thing that we focus on uh, with regards to life sciences is actually the digital health. Uh, the point where the digital uh, wave is meeting medical devices, turning in, into everything uh, being more personalized, preventive. Um, lots of uh, Israeli companies are innovating it. So we have in Israel a very interesting set of technologies. On one hand, we are doing cybersecurity, preventing people to do bad stuff. On the other hand, we are investing in digital he health companies which are trying to help to do good. Uh, those two areas are exploding in Israel. In addition to that, uh, there's a lot of innovation in everything that is uh, related to robotic systems, whether it's uh, self-driving uh, cars, whether it's drones. Um, we try to uh, adapt uh, the kind of security through the cybersecurity, but through the management of uh, big data. 
Uh, we are moving deeply into virtual reality and augmented reality, actually augmenting the human, uh, the humankind uh, into something new, into something stronger and better than it used to be. Um, and I think we are, what we are doing is we're actually looking very carefully on how the digital wave is swiping through different industries. It started with communication, it moved to media, now it's in financials, healthcare, transportation. I hope soon we'll see also education. So basically it creates uh, a new brave world and leads to two mega trends. One is the creation of many, many startups. The young generation today is paving a new world of building new companies. This is why the book Startup Nation was so successful. More young people today choose to start companies than to work in existing businesses. We need to understand that. On the other hand, the internet is connecting all of us, including IoT, and creates a much bigger market with much faster growth opportunities. So actually, we see disruption uh, on those areas. I would say the last point is probably innovation in the way we invest. Uh, first of all, we think that the way the world is measuring companies is not complete. Number one, we need to understand what is the value of data, intellectual property. Intellectual property. Secondly, we need to judge companies by the way they treat environments, social issues, and governance. So investors, at the end of the day, when we, they will look at global companies which are transitioning us from the old age into the new era, we'll measure them by how effective they are economically, but also in other parameters. Very quickly, do you want to name maybe two companies that we're not talking about yet, but we'll be talking about a lot in a couple of years, even if you're an investor in them? Well, I would say I would use one because we don't have enough time. Uh, we are investors in a company called uh, Via, which is actually changing public transportation. All of you heard about Uber, which is actually allowing you to use an app to book a car. And then that car is taking you from point A to point B. It's great, it's very comfortable, but it doesn't really change the life of people. Uh, VIA is working in major cities where they see people need to commute from home to work and back from work to home in rush hours. Today they use public transportation with it, which is rigid. You have to meet their time schedule, you, meet, you have to go to fixed stations, and you have to use fixed lines. So we are leveraging big data analytics and predict prediction in order to adapt the public transportation to you. So you book a seat, or two seats, or three seats, or four, and you have a fixed price ticket, and you can go to home and back and forth. So watch out for Via. Zach, very quickly, you're seeing the emerging stars of the future. A couple of trend lines you're seeing, and maybe one company that we need to remember. So um, a lot of the things that Chemi talked about are connected to one thing, which is machine learning, which people call AI now, uh, artificial intelligence. And I think that for years, technology has been developed in Israel in the army, but now the world needs that in a big way. Uh, so the two things that we see is, is how AI gets into new spaces, like all the bots that you see now, and, and the future of, of messaging, and which, which are a lot of these bots and AI companies. So lots of great AI companies. And the second thing is, which also connects to some of the things that Chemi said, is, is IoT, but IoT that's more industrial or commercial IoT. So um, um, analyzing what comes from the drones, analyzing what comes from machine, industrial machines. A lot of the companies in here in France are using old machines they're not going to replace in the next 25 years. Uh, all these machines are creating signals that no one really knows to read in a proper way. So I think a lot of the interesting startups we see now are, are going into these fields and, and collecting this data and making, um, and making good use of it. And who's uh, going to be the next ways? Examples, um, um, you know, interesting couple of companies, and some of them are still you know, fairly small. We have a graduate uh, called WC Sports, a company that takes and analyzes uh, the video feeds from uh, NBA. So they, they, they stream 50% of the NBA content online. And they analyze every video feed, and they know exactly which player played, how much points he scored, real time. So when you on Wired or any other magazine needs in real time to write an article or, and, and put in the highlights of a game, there's no person that needs to go and edit that video. It comes all automatically. So just one example. Last word to Amit. Very quickly, a couple of trends you're seeing in the companies you're helping, and you probably can't name them. 
Well, uh, you know, we have a saying in Hebrew that prophecy was given to fools, and we try to stick by it when we are doing our policy in the government in order not to be biased. So it's very difficult to But you predict. can share trends. You can share okay, growth so, curves. So I, I can say that cybersecurity is becoming a huge issue all over the world, and Israel has a very, very uh, impressive ecosystem in that sense, and I guess uh, this, is, this is going to be one of the trends during the next decade. The other trend which I see, and again, very carefully mentioned, is the transportation and especially the autonomous driving and the systems around it. Again, Israel, because of the defense need and all kinds of uh, technology that comes from the defense need regarding the uh, night vision and sensors and things like that, will be leading, I guess, this, uh, this uh, area during the next decade. You heard it here first. If you follow their advice, the value of your investments can go down as well as up. Please, could we thank our esteemed panelists, Edouard, Amit, Chemi, Adam, Zach, and Reem. Let's hear it for them. Thank you all.